What is going on YouTube? It's the brain of the main brain of the mainframe here, Niall Scala. And I am just I'm just pickled pink here, you know. You're pickled I pink, you, huh? I'm pickled pink because I'm excited. Oh. We've got an amazing guest tonight, guys. Billy, JC, how are we doing? Awesome, man. Yeah, pretty great today. Very, very it's excited to be so here. Excited about this one. As am I, as am I. I've been a, uh a hero talking to a, a bunch of people today. Everyone is just, oh my gosh, even the chat is just exploding right now. Wow. Holy smokes. Yeah, we definitely have a great show that's lined up. We've got just, I mean, for me growing up, I mean, the guest we have tonight, I, I've read so many of his books. Like, this is going to be amazing, guys. This is going to be fan. This is going to be wonderful. This is really going to be wonderful. When you're, when you're talking about uh, some serious high points of mm -hmm. comics and things that have had impact over a long run yes. and continue to sell. That's that's a pretty freaking good test. Yeah. Oh yeah. And adaptations into other media, you know, television, Indeed. movies. Of course, I mean, and of course, very recently we're talking about. And too. very recently, yes. And and the quality of those shows. I mean, I I'm impressed with them. Um, boy, gentlemen, I would almost say, you know, without further ado, I think we should uh, get our Let's guest on this screen. I think we should. <laughs> JC, as our lovely uh, guest host tonight, would you be happy to do the honors? I would love to. I can think of very few people that have had the impact on comics, both as a writer and editor, that Marv Wolfman has had. And here he is. <laughs> Marv Wolfman, welcome are to we, the show. Why were we muted? Mr. Wolfman, good to see you, sir. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you, Billy? Oh, good. Oh, now I'm looking at it. Oh, so you ran. I'm looking at at the 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 stream yard. So on the actual crowdfunding on the YouTube, you had the whole introduction. That great thing you did with the curtain opening and everything. Yes, I did. Oh, that was wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. I gotta, both, I gotta look at both things. Wow, well done, uh, Mr. Wolfman. How are you this evening? I am fine, and you? Uh, you know, I'm uh, better now talking to you. I got to tell you that. Um, uh, you are just you. You are such a big influence on on all three of us here, and I'm sure everyone else out there watching, and the people that will stream uh, tune in to watch this video. And uh, I just want to say it's a real great honor to have you on. You really are. It's just I think I speak for everyone. I mean, this is just it's an honor, right, Jeff? I mean, <laughs> you were, you were the ten bucks. <laughs> you got it. I mean, uh, you know, we're reverting back to you know our our our. Our, ourselves when we were larks and you were a lark too making comics and all but uh marv uh you want to i don't know yeah. a man who needs no introduction but maybe you want to tell give us a little something about yourself like how did you get into comics oh come on we go there? in pretty much the same way uh we become fans yeah the in my case it was uh watching the adventures of superman tv show with george Reeves. uh yeah Back in 1950, whatever that was, 1, 52, there were no other superheroes around. There was nothing like it. Mm -hmm. So when when my friend and I accidentally kept the TV on a little bit longer than we had planned, um, as we were watching, and the next show on was Adventures of Superman, and it just was mind, mind blowing. Uh, and at the end, it said, based on the comic, and we got up and walked to the corner with the, where there was a newsstand and bought our first comics. And it was Superman. Oh, that's great. So it, it hit exactly at the right time. It was something that just challenged the imagination. This guy was flying. He was doing all these things. It was really cool. Had no idea who Superman was prior to that. But I was five or six years old, and it hit me perfectly, and I became a fan, well, still <laughs> to today. Yeah. I, I intend to stop tomorrow, though. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Never. That's, you've had enough. I had enough. No. You've had enough. I mean, so in your career, I mean, you've you've hit many different levels. Um, you know, in the industry, you know, you, you you've written uh, that you've been the editor in chief of Marvel Comics. I mean, all these experiences, just you know, I, I mean, how, what was it like? I mean, you've basically got to taste every every part of the of a of the career you could have. Well, you know, uh, I, I just mentioned the adventures of Superman. The first thing you do is you come up with stories on your own. You come up with mm -hmm. ideas on your own because you've been challenged in a way with these great things that you're seeing. 
And my mind went to, okay, what, what are things I'm going to create with Superman? You know, never thinking that you could do, sell a comic book or anything, because you didn't even know people did that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so you get into it. I started by doing some, uh, first as a reader, and then I had a letter published in a comic, a Julie Schwartz comic, and I had my address. And about a week later, I got the very first fanzines mailed to me. They were trying to, uh, I guess, find people who would be interested in joining. And since they, uh, Julie Schwartz always printed the addresses, on one day I got two fanzines. That brought me in, and I saw other people doing comics, making their own comics, and I had my own stories. And my interest was art back then. Uh, I really wanted to be an artist. Um, and uh, it just took off from there. Uh, so first I started to do the, my own fanzines, and I sent them in to the different editors. There were only a very few editors back then. It's not like today, where there are hundreds. Uh, back then there were just a half dozen at most. And uh, one of my fanzines was a horror fanzine called Stories of Suspense. Another was Super Adventures, which was a superhero one. There was one called The Food that was a comedy one, and one an opinion fanzine. But Joe Orlando, who was uh, an editor at DC, uh, saw my horror fanzine, Serious of Suspense, and asked if I wanted to submit an idea. And I did. And he took it. At the same time, uh, I was a big fan of Blackhawk, which was a comic that DC had actually bought yeah. from Quality Comics. Right. And I love the Blackhawk stuff. Uh, went back and saw a lot of the older ones uh, when I could see them and really fell in love with the book. And then at some point, DC didn't know what to do with it because they had bought the, bought the title and really they wrecked it. They, they completely destroyed it. Um, and so I wrote my own story uh, to, to make the Blackhawks good again. I didn't know that you couldn't do things like that. Um, and what had happened, let me go back a second. What had happened was when I submitted the idea, uh, submitted a letter to Julie, the one that got me into fandom, uh, and the address was printed, uh, Julie used to give away scripts and art and stuff like that to people whose letters he printed. Um, and they sent me a script, a Gardner Fox script for whatever it was. I don't even remember. So I know what a script looked like. That's cool. Yeah. And I wrote a Blackhawks script. Now I understand the words are on spec and mailed it and never, of course, heard anything after that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, a year later, um, the editor uh, was let go. And, uh, um, and Nick Giordano got the job. Dick came in and opened his desk and he found a sealed letter, sealed envelope in the back of his desk. And it was my story. He opened it up and it was my story, and which confused me completely when I heard it because if the previous editor wasn't going to read it, why did he keep it? Yeah. Uh, it seems a little like fate. Yeah. 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 Threw it into the back of the uh, thing, uh, back of the desk. Dick asked me if I still wanted to read it, uh, him to read it. I said yes. He read it and he bought it, and that was a simultaneous to my doing the horror story for D for Joe Orlando. So that's how I broke in uh, through Phantom. That's great. Wow. So what was the story? Well, you know, well, uh, this uh, the Blackhawk story was the second to last issue of Blackhawk. It was already dead. Uh, maybe that's why they didn't mind do it. Uh, Bob Haney read, uh, redid the dialogue. It's my mm -hmm. story, and it's uh, I think it's Blackhawk two forty three or one forty three. I don't I don't remember. Um, I could show you. It's here. Uh, I have a copy of it in my office. Uh, but yeah, it's um, it was a beautiful job, uh, uh, and it was published. And in the horror comic, uh, I what's, what's the name of the story? Oh my God, I have a uh, Roots of Evil. That's the one. Uh, typical House of Mystery type story. Mm. And so that was fun. That's great. <laughs> That's incredible. I mean, right? Just a story like, you know, it, from, from, <laughs> it, JC, please oh, no, chat. You've no, got some yeah, great questions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I, no, okay. One of the things, one of the things that occurs to me, uh, having done both writing and editing, uh, to, even to this day, very few people have been the editor-in-chief of Marvel Comics. Yeah. How did your editorial duties 
later affect you as a writer? The I started as an editor for Joe Kubert, assistant editor for Joe Kubert. Um, Joe needed an assistant at the office since he was doing half of his work at home, drawing Tarzan and, and various things. So he sure. couldn't be in the office every day. So my job was to uh, handle everything in the office and go over stories and sometimes even rewrite them if Joe asked me to. Um, I learned how to deal with the uh, creators that way. And you learn that you learn it doesn't always sink in, and I made more mistakes than you could possibly imagine. But it certainly teaches you uh, perhaps to be a little bit calmer and um, take a look at the material. I failed miserably on that, but uh, for the most part, I was able to get through it. And what it does is just reminds you you could be on the other side of the desk mm-hmm. and start thinking of yourself as on the other side of the desk, you're not going to scream at somebody. Mm. Or at least you hope you're not going to scream at someone. That 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 sounds that sounds pretty right, really. And you had the, uh, 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 I think, incredible fortune. It's because mm-hmm. you 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 have some projects where you're associated with some some really amazing artists, but you were associated with a wide variety of different characters and series. That... Uh, I missed some of that. Uh, oh, okay. You were associated with a wide variety of characters and series at Marvel, but many consider your run on Tuma Dracula with Gene Colan and Tom Palmer to be a crown jewel. Uh, you, you didn't launch that series, but how long did it take it to make it, make it your own? Uh, it was interesting. I got a call from Roy asking me to uh, look over the Dracula novel again. Uh, and... Uh, asked if I'd be interested. I really wasn't. Uh, I was not a vampire fan. I've never seen a vampire movie. I've never seen a Dracula movie. For the most part, I still haven't. Um, never seen the Bela Lugosi film or any of the Hammer films. Uh, but I read the novel and I loved it. Uh, the novel was just brilliant um, and told in a very different style. But it was all essentially about the people. It was about the Dracula hunters, not Dracula, because it's letters that the different characters are writing each other and there's nothing written by Dracula. So you learn about Dracula and you learn about what's happening through the letters all these other people are reading. And it was a really great way of um, of telling a story. Uh, so he, Roy told me uh, that I'd be starting with issue seven and at this point it was on issue three. And, um, Archie Goodwin was writing issues three and four. Jerry Conway wrote issues one and two. Uh, Archie three and four and Gardner Fox five and six. And they already knew that uh, they didn't have anyone after Gardner. And nobody really wanted to do it because um, uh, anybody who was up at Marvel wanted to do the superhero material. Uh, They asked me to do it. I didn't want to, but you can't say no because I was looking for work and all of that and reread the novel and fell in love with it and immediately had my hand up for it. I knew exactly what I wanted to do with it. Uh, it had to be based on how the characters see him. He had to be a force of nature rather than just a monster. He had to be a real character. He had to be someone who considered himself special because he wasn't, he was, you know, a lot of vampires. He was a mm-hmm. main character, so had to turn him into a human being. And the beautiful thing about that is there's nobody better at drawing real people than Gene Colan. Yeah. He was just utterly brilliant. And he, he desperately wanted that book. He, want, he did an audition to get onto it because it was originally assigned to somebody else. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, he just wanted to do it, and I wrote my first plot. I had no idea if I, I'd stay on a, uh, the book because I wasn't sure if they'd like what I did or not, and fortunately they did, and we kept it going. They expected to last, I think, another couple of issues uh, because there were three writers or four writers in the first seven issues. Right. Not a very good sign, and fortunately with Gene and, uh, Gene and I working pretty close together, and seem to want to do the same type of book. Uh, 
the book last year. We did. I did seventy issues. Or seventy. Say, the book series ran seventy issues. Wow. Uh, you had a you had a, a Doctor Strange crossover, mm -hmm. and the, the finale was I think double or triple sized. Yeah, uh, it was. Yeah. And uh, not not to totally sound like too much of a geek, but that's where I that's where I learned your work. Mm -hmm. um, oh, thank you. What yeah. was it? Uh, is it the characters, or 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 what was it about it that you were able to, if you'll excuse the pun, sink your teeth into? Well Ooh. done, well done, old Dean. Well done. <laughs> there are two forms of writing in my mind that appeal to emotions first and foremost: horror and comedy. If a comedy isn't funny, you're not going to laugh. If you're not put on edge by a horror story, it fails. Yeah. Superheroes yeah. are like a detective story. You have a plot that twists and turns and you go back and forth and you try to try to make it all work and you try to um, just follow the paths of the story. But it's not something that affects you emotionally as much. Mostly it's intellectually as you're trying to figure out the story. There are, of course, great stories that are going to affect you emotionally, but the purpose of it is to follow the plot. Mm -hmm. Follow yeah. the characters in that fashion. So I just love the idea that I could write stories about people because I had, I wasn't really interested. I wasn't good at writing superhero stuff. Back then. I would not get the jobs. Those were not the ones given to me. Every time I tried to, I didn't get it, even though I was a major superhero fan. But as a writer, my tendencies tended towards the the horror material and comedy material was the editor of Crazy Magazine. And, uh, you know that what you're what you're saying about that it makes sense to me, but that makes it all the more intriguing. Yeah. When you left Marvel for DC, it was sort of a sort of a vibrant time for both companies in terms of what they were trying. I think Marvel was by and large succeeding more at first, but Marvel's X Men was hitting its stride. Uh, the comic book direct market was coming into its own. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I mentioned before the show started, uh, I was working at Lone Star and we were selling as many new Teen Titans as we were selling X-Men. And it was, I don't mean exclusively a Marvel store, but the audience, I, you know, as a layman, I would guess two to one, you know, and, and, and so you just said you weren't, you weren't that good at the superhero stuff. What happened now? Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's there, there. I don't know. I think it's when I was assigned Spider-Man, um, which <coughs> I didn't want. I wanted Fantastic Four, but I was yeah. told by the editor because I loved that. I loved all those insane things that Kirby and Simon, uh, Kirby and Lee were coming up with, just endless new concepts and, and things I had never seen before, and really wanted the FF. And I was told I could get the FF if. I also took Spider-Man and I didn't think I could do Spider-Man because Stan's dialogue was so unique. Sure. There was nothing like that elsewhere. What I found was I couldn't do the FF up to the standards I wanted, which was the Stan Lee, Jack Kirby material. I wanted that endless creative feel that, uh, that they gave the book, but Spider-Man's dialogue was natural to me. It felt, I fell right into the pattern. Yeah. And I love writing the humor. In fact, if you notice, everything I write, including Dracula, has lots of humor in it. Uh, yeah. I believe in that. I believe in telling those uh, telling those stories. So with, with you just enjoying it and having the fun parts and having those lines uh, um, of dialogue just make the reader laugh for a bit, and that's why I included as much in, into... Um, uh, Dracula, as well as Teen Titans or Fantastic Four or any of the others that I had done. I don't think I answered your question, but I've forgotten what it is. Yeah, I, it, well, <laughs> why, why do you think, okay, I'll, I'll boil it down to another one. Why do you think it was the right time for that book? Why, you know I mean, because it really, a lot of other people who were in retail at the time, a lot of other fans who, who were coming into the, the market at the time would say the same thing that I just said, which is, mm -hmm. They might have been Marvel fans, but they bought New Teen Titans. Why was it the right time for that book? Well, uh, George and I used to say that we were doing DC's first Marvel book. Uh, mm -hmm. that, yeah, we both came over from um, Marvel. We both learned mm -hmm. them. I learned pretty much everything I knew from Stan, directly from Stan. 
I was his assistant. I was his editor in chief, but I was also prior to that the editor of all the hor- uh, all the black and white magazines. Right. Mm-hmm. So I learned an awful lot from him, and uh, George learned from everybody. I mean, uh, you look at his stuff from Kirby certainly, but Kurt Swan is one of his favorites too. Yeah, sure. So, and we so, that we worked together well. We worked together really well and became friends as well. Uh, we did some work at Marvel together, and. The whole approach that we took with the Titans was we, I'd come in with the idea. We lived near each other, so we go, we get together and at a diner and just talk over the stuff. I'd come in with the idea, then we'd start breaking it down. And the feeling was if one of us disagreed with anything, we'd just come up with a different idea. We'd trash it. It was mm-hmm. better to do that than to ever have an argument because we're both trying to do the best comics we can do. We're not here for our ego. I already had my ego stroke with Dracula or he with the Avengers. Mm-hmm. So we already had that. We didn't mm-hmm. need to do the in that fashion, but we did need to tell good stories and make sure that both of us were on the same page. And that did mean never have an argument and we never did in all the years it, it really did seem like when we would read about you guys in the fan press and when we got to see you at store signings and conventions and things it really seemed like you guys were simpatico on that book and, and we're in quite a groove i want to i want to go a step further on that and then i i really should stop asking questions and let billy and niall <laughs> chime in it's their I'm show listening to them these are fantastic but, questions you're asking but the The thing that fascinates me about the Titans is both before you with like, say, the the great Nick Cardi covers and that were so compelling and things like that. And after you uh, with some creators who really have put, you know, pretty significant effort into it. It's never captured lightning in the bottle the way you guys did. Do you have any idea why that is? I think we would... We were working together to do the best book we could do for us. Uh, we did not think it would last. Back then, if you go back in time to 1980, uh, DC hadn't had a hit for years. Uh, most most of their books were canceled by issue six. Yeah, I mean, you were coming, you were coming right after the implosion. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we assumed that we'd get six issues, and then it would be dead. But then I wanted Superman, and George wanted the JLA. Mm -hmm. And we figured we do our six issues, do them exactly what we always wanted to do in comics, just, you know, have fun for those six months, do the book, do the book we wanted to do, and then we move on to the other stuff. Um, 60, 70 issues later, George finally uh, wow. went to crisis and then Wonder Woman after that. And I, I got Superman and a couple of the other titles. Crazy. But uh, I think that the fact that we were doing a book for us, we were really doing the book we wanted to tell and the stories we wanted to tell, uh, huh. that really helped. And obviously it was plugged in correctly at the time. And the, the fact that we were aging the characters, mm-hmm. uh, the original Teen Titans looked like they were eight or nine or 10. Um, except when Nick Carter drew Wonder Girl. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, uh, it just, yeah, I just think it was the right characters. I, I, people really like what we did with Robin, aging him, bringing all the characters to be 18, 19, and 20, except for Changeling. Uh, so you really had a feeling these characters were growing, and they were no longer the Junior Justice League. There was no reason ever to do the junior justice league. And I wasn't interested in them. I wasn't interested in an adult mentor, which uh, they had in the early run of Titans, uh, sure. Mr. Jupiter or something like that. Uh, I felt that at 18, 19 and 20, you're old enough to go into the army. You're old enough to get married. You're old enough to drive. You're old enough to drink. These are adults. Yeah. 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 I was going to tell the story about them as adults as people just becoming adults. And that's a really difficult time in people's lives Mm -hmm. uh, where you're in everything, you know, is being changed. You cannot be prepared no matter what you've done to suddenly have to find your first apartment. Yeah. That night suddenly realize there's no one there to make dinner for you. Yeah. 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 You know, all of those, I just did uh, Superman special man and Superman all about that same type of thing. Because it's the most important part 
time in almost anyone's life is that moment where they're no longer at home, but have to go out and be on their own. And they've never been on their own, no matter how much they learn how to be good, how much they learn how to use their abilities or whatever else, they've never been alone. Mm -hmm. have to solve all their problems. Yeah. And I think the readers saw that what we were doing in there had a reflection in real life. Mm -hmm. And we uh, we received a, a super chat from Brian <coughs> Blevins asking, uh, he's, he's asking about crisis. Was there any pushback or backlash when you pitched the idea of killing DC's heroes during crisis? No. How did the pitch go and or story of its creation? No, no, there was none. Um, uh, it was all understood. The one I thought we'd get the vote, we'd get some problem with was uh, killing Supergirl. Uh, mm -hmm. That was my, my suggestion because we wanted to make Superman. We wanted to revise Superman and make him the sole survivor of Krypton. By the time 1980 came around, I think there were like 15 billion characters from uh, Krypton around. I mean, he had the whole bottle of city. Mm -hmm. uh, he had all oh, Supergirl. He had the dogs. He had cats. Uh, you know, it doesn't. Matter. I think there was a super accountant. Uh, <laughs> all over the place. There were just too many, and you can't do a unique character if he's not unique. So yeah. the whole idea was that I was pretty sure they wouldn't accept it. Also because of the Supergirl movie that was going to be coming out, but they did. They saw the value in having Superman be the last son of Krypton. We always assumed there'd be a Supergirl uh, one day in the future, but not for years. And in fact, it took years before she did come back. It did. Uh, it did. DC, they recommended, DC asked for Flash's death. I didn't ask for that. So um, uh, that was one that was on uh, DC side. Ma Marv, was, if, if we make for, for Crisis, was there a big writer summit? And with the editorial staff, everything, and this said, we, we need an event. We need to change this. We need to, you know, Steve Trevor, all this. We've got to update. Was, was there a big collective, you know, big writer and editorial meeting, and that's what started? Or, like, how did the germ of the idea come? Who, or, because I'm sure you guys were rumbling about it, like, oh, we've got to, these, yeah. we've got to change this. You know, these characters need, have been a little stagnant, like you said, you know, you know, you got the super dog and the, and, you know, and Supergirl and Super Accountant, you know, crypto, blah, blah, blah. But, like, like, how did that come about? That Because that was the first real monumental, yeah. you know, explosion within comics, you, you know, universe exploding. Mm -hmm. The I've told the story a ton of times, and it's actually in the, in the uh, preface of every version of Crisis. Um, a fan asked about trying, about how confusing the continuity was. And uh, he sent a letter to Green Lantern. I was the writer of Green Lantern. I was doing the letter columns as well. And I, I wrote back in the letter column saying, yeah, one, one of these days we'll have to do something about that. That evening we were heading to a Comic-Con in Philadelphia or Pittsburgh, someplace in, in Pennsylvania. And I got there, I got to the uh, train station early. Uh, and by the time everyone showed up about an hour later, all of crisis, I come to me. I wow. just you know, we talked about the whole thing. I mean, not the whole plot, but just the whole concept. Um, and um, when I we I talked to all of them, they all thought it was a great idea. I came in Monday and pitched it to Dick Giordano. He immediately brought me into Jeanette Khan, who was the publisher, and pitched it to her. Uh, this was not something DC asked for. This was something I came in with and saying, we have to do something big. It can't be small. It can't be just another silly story. This has to be huge. It has to go through every single DC character and every DC comic has to be affected by it. And they love that idea. I think the fact that the sales at that point were not very good, this seemed to be something that may help. You couldn't, it, you know, it was, it was a suggestion and they really thought that it could work. It took a while. I uh, pitched it immediately. We advertised it as the history of the DC universe. You'll see ads in the uh, comics for that. We talked about it at the DC convention, uh, but I kept delaying it because I was researching stuff. 
And uh, they finally said, are we going to do this? It's like three years later. I said, yeah, 50th anniversary is coming up in two, in two years. I want to do it for that. Make it a real special thing for the 50th. And that they really loved. Nice. And, uh, everyone was told to uh, follow what I was suggesting. The editors were not very happy with it. Um, uh, nobody really, except for the people in charge, liked the idea. I would have thought it'd be the other way around, but yeah, it, because the problem was, and I understand it because I'm a fan, uh, first and foremost, all of us were, but uh, the editors didn't want to see the things that they grew up with changed. They really loved that stuff, they really loved it, so did I. Yeah. But you have to step back, and one of the things Stan always talked about you step back and you really look at it. And you, uh, you have to make some decisions. There's a term in writers about killing your babies. Uh, sometimes you have to do that in order to make a better story. Mm -hmm. And we had to do some drastic stuff. Otherwise, God knows what, this, what would happen with DC. And you, you, mentioned, you mentioned Dick Giordano was the editor you took it to. Obviously, George, is a bit, George was a big component in this. But who, who other people, who other had uh, batted things back and forth with you and had a hand in this? Um, well, George actually came in later because George wasn't going to be doing it. Oh, okay. Now, um, he was going to be going on to Wonder Woman and a couple of other things, and I don't remember all the issues. And uh, uh, um, and he, every month we get together for Titans and I would tell him what I was doing with the crisis, slowly developing, as I say, it took a little bit longer than I expected uh, because this really had to be perfect. Uh, it sounds egotistical to say that, but it had to be the absolute best thing that I could do. And it had to work on every level that I couldn't have plot holes and I couldn't, have, because that would sink it. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. such a big idea and it's changing everybody's childhood. If it was done wrong, it would really have affected DC badly. And so I had plenty of time and I would tell George and finally he went, okay, I want to do this. Is still pop it? Is it still possible? I said, I've been praying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but nobody else could have done the job like he did. Uh, and one of that, the greatest comic covers of all time. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I was, I was yeah. into the plotting of the whole thing. Um, and the first bunch of issues were already plotted. Uh, once George came in, we were able to co-plot. I mean, again, I'd come in with the ideas. I, I had the entire story outlined from day one, but then we'd sit together and plot the little things, the details, the rem always remembering this was a character-driven story, even though it's the most huge thing in the world. But sure. If the characters weren't interesting in it, if it looked like they were just pawns being pushed around the chessboard, that would have been bad. So always had to remember this was a character-driven story and how each of the characters reacts to what's going on. Uh, one of the things that other writers have mentioned to me wonderfully, because it's a great, great ego boo, is that there's a section in one of the later issues where Supergirl and Batgirl are just sitting on a like on top of a uh, giant building in Gotham and Batgirl is talking about how worried she is and how frightened she is. And it's an all character story, the type of thing you don't see. So not I, think, I, I think that's, I think that's fundamentally true throughout this series, which you, you just alluded to the fact that that's odd in this epic event kind of thing. Yeah. But I, I think the thing that most impressed me, if you go back to it is it's the first time we ever see, or to me, as a casual DC fan, like I said, I was a Marvel kid, but where you see the crime syndicate ha exhibiting any nobility and you buy into it in the matter of just a couple pages. Yeah, you, um, Alan Moore is the only person who ever understood why that sequence was there. He wrote a letter to me and, uh, <laughs> but everybody, everyone asked me, why did you begin with a crime syndicate? The whole book, you, you do this, these characters and you get rid of them in four pages and why did you even bother? Nobody cares about the crime syndicate. I said, no, no, you have to understand, I am not going to be showing Superman, Batman and Wonder Woman in the beginning, not for multiple issues. The reason is every time you speak to a Marvel fan as to what they don't like about DC, they'll say the Superman stories, I, you know, he could do anything, he's boring. Wonder Woman, I'm a stupid Amen. 
character, Batman, yeah. you know, they don't know what Batman is or anything like this. So I was determined that none of the major DC characters would appear because I wanted to show the readers how many great characters were up at DC. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I wanted to also show how powerful the villain was. So the crime syndicate, for those who don't know, um, was essentially an alternate Earth and uh, in one of the infinite Earths, but all the heroes were villains on that planet. Mm-hmm. So the Superman character was Ultraman, mm-hmm. was Superman, and the Wonder Woman character was I forget her name and Batman. Was it Princess, was it Princess Power? Not possible. Something like that. The Batman was Owlman. And, and of course, and of course, and of course, uh, Luther was the the sole hero on that. Yeah, on that, and it was Earth three. But the 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 idea was that these were all the doppelgangers. So in four pages, and the readers were not aware of this, as I say, Alan Moore's the only one. In four pages, the villain kills Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, Flash, all of those. He shows how easy it is for him to destroy all of them. Psychologically, Superwoman. All the readers go, my God, this character is more powerful than Superman. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so everything had to be thought out in those terms a lot of it the readers never got which is fine we don't care as long as the alt as long as it works at the end as long as it leads them in the direction that you want them to go in and in the case of a uh, crisis it was vital to show how powerful he was because he wasn't going to be showing up for six or eight issues the film mm-hmm. and superman and batman and wonder woman were going to show up for the first couple because i i had to show how good all the other characters <clears throat> So. Mm-hmm. Now, now, just uh, if I may, uh, Jeff. Um, Absolutely. Because, because this is, you know, one of the most. This is one of the pivotal, pivotal, most monumental storylines in, in, you know, and and events in comics history, and like the, and, and we look at it now as canon. You know what I mean? It, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it, it, it was a great thing. It was something that was needed. How was it? received were, were again were a lot of the fan base did they react similar to the way the editors did were there did you get hate mail you know i know it's, it's beloved and it, you know and at the end everyone mm-hmm. realized what happened but how was it through the process of this like did you us been at one point the most hated man in comics or something <laughs> i will tell you that at the time teen titans was outselling all of the dc comics four to one wow oh yeah Oh, yeah. Except for Legion, which it was outselling two to one. But <laughs> on the uh, Crisis outsold Titans two to one. So it was double the sales of Titans. It, the readers just gravitated towards it. They really loved it. I was told by somebody up uh, at the company who's no longer in comics whatsoever that nobody was going to buy this. Nobody was interested in it. <laughs> and I was really happy when it outsold everything by that by that um, there, One of the things, one of the things that I think about it was that uh, just using the crime syndicate as an example, uh, and with your understanding, where a lot of Marvel fans were particularly coming about super, about <laughs> Superman, um, they thought Superman's boring because he could do anything. Little did we know that it was that Superman wasn't in the hands of the right writers. Uh, yeah, exactly. We would learn that we would learn that a, a little while later, uh, but I think I think ca- having had the Marvel experience, uh, you really made it to where Crisis was the gateway drug to a lot of other DC stuff for Marvel fans like me. And I and I, I you know I, I hesitate to use myself as an example, except I've talked to so many people over the years. That that's the case. It's, it's very it's very strange because uh, you know when I'm at a convention, I'm signing. I get all these people coming up to me with crisis, saying this is their first DC comic, and I'm going, you understood it? Mm. Not a, back then, at least it, it would have been in the ether in some way. We're mm-hmm. 37 years out, and it's still their first DC comic uh, in so many ways. And I, I I don't know how they pick up on it. I've always uh, Stan drummed it into us that everything had to be clear. So his characters are named, <laughs> something you don't always see all the time. Right, right. Mine yeah. may be complex, but it had to be told in a very clear fashion so that new, re- since it was all being done to get to draw the Marvel readers over to DC to see how good DC was, mm-hmm. it, 
had to be clear for them, even though they had never read any of the other ZC books. So yeah. you work at it and you try, you, you work at the, the clarity of telling a story and making it work for people who had never seen it before, don't even understand it, don't even want it, but are just buying it because it's everybody's talking about it. But it has to be understood by everyone, and it also has to be understood by the DC fans who knew every little bit of trivia the same way I did. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, what's it like, though? I mean, you, you've you know these stories have been around. I mean, it's 2020. You know, these are getting adapted into TV. You know, into TV shows, into animated um, shows, uh, animated movies. And, you know, storylines are incorporated into video games. I mean, your work is continuing and continuing on. Um, What's what's it been like seeing it the, on the small screen and, and you know parts of the big screen and all that stuff? It's pretty amazing because when I got into comics, that was not even a possibility. Mm -hmm. um, no one thought that that type of material would do well outside of comic fans. Um, it was something we just never even assumed. We were doing comics to tell the story for comics. I wasn't. There was no way on God's good earth that we'd ever have a theatrical version of Crisis. It's just too big a story. Can't that be. Was, yeah. You know, Niall, Niall, that was a really good quote. Marv, thinking about it in terms of in terms of comics, did you ever imagine we'd still be talking about it this many years later? You just froze. Hi. You uh -oh. just froze. You just froze. I didn't hear a word you said. Uh, sorry, All right. I'm, uh, okay. my problem. All right. Uh, just talking about it in terms of comics, you know, uh, did you did you ever think we would still be talking about Crisis this many years later? I never thought we'd be talking about Crisis immediately afterwards. <laughs> you, laugh, you laugh, but in my mind, Crisis was not the book that people would be talking about. It was the road. It was the map to take DC to its new world. So I thought that all the new DC stuff, all the new characters, mm -hmm. all the new approaches, everything that we had hoped would, uh, would would come out of crisis, that that was where their focus would be, not the road, but the end of the journey. Mm -hmm. And so when I say I didn't think crisis would be remembered, I'm not being silly, I'm not being modest or anything. I just thought of it as that's taking us to where all the good stuff going to be. But it had to be really well done on its own. It had to work on its own. It had to make sense on its own. So, no, I never expected it, but I'm delighted. Uh, I've been told by so many people, professionals, uh, you know, people from other businesses, uh, it, it was the book that got them interested in comics. And as a writer, that's what you want. You yeah. want that uh, to happen, and you don't know if it's going to succeed or not. But I can tell you that George and I put everything we had into it. Uh, mm. uh, I don't think we left anything on the table. Now, have you had a creative hand, like a creative hand in like, so you have the Teen Titans, you had, I believe, uh, two varying uh, animated series. Uh, then you had the Teen Titan uh, mo animated movie. Obviously the CW, which you had an appearance on, you know, just aired a couple weeks ago. Um, <laughs> have you had a hand in, in these adaptations? No, I wish I did. I would love to have done some of the animated movies. Um, they never asked. No. <laughs> no, I haven't. I've done tons of animation, but just not for DC. But you now for CW though, you did get to write I got, uh, for the last episode of Crisis, yeah. correct? I'm talking about the animation stuff. Oh, okay. CW um, people have been just wonderful about that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the DC people have been great too. I mean, uh, I'm still uh, considering my age and everything. I'm still getting work. You know, it's mm -hmm. very rare that uh, people keep working uh, in this business because I still love it. So, you know, I, how, love, how, I would love to do that stuff. Yeah. And I mean, I, I, I'm a fan. I'll be honest. I'm a fan of, of the Titan series, the live action series on DC Universe. I think yeah, it's, it's great. Yeah. Absolutely great. And 
I can't wait for season three. I think they're really building this up and the characters and the story arc and everything is, is beautiful. Um, CW, I've been a fan since Arrow started. Aren't they doing um, a great job? They're doing a great job. And, you know, I, 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 I read, I think, with Arrow going out, maybe they're having a Superman and Lois series. I hope that's true. I'd love to see that. Um, Flash is definitely amazing. But um, how was it like doing a, a cameo? Yeah, yeah, and how did that come about? How did yeah. that transpire? I loved that. Yeah, I find it, Marv. <laughs> Mark, uh, Mark Guggenheim, who's the uh, showrunner for the Crisis, and was previously on uh, Arrow and executive producer, uh, is a major fan, major comic fan, and um, uh, he asked me if I'd like to be in a cameo. I assumed he meant I'd be in a crowd scene or something like that. <laughs> Um, then I was sent the script and the lines I'd have to memorize and I'm not very good at that I have a very bad short term memory <laughs> so, uh, I really went insane trying to remember those lines I finally finally got it done but uh, uh, he was doing that because he just loves he loved those books he loves the material and Greg Belanti the same um Years ago, I read an interview with him. I think Arrow had just begun uh, uh, saying that well, all of his friends were really big fans of Watchmen and um, Dark Knight, and he was a big fan of Titans and Crisis. So, and this was at a time when neither were available to be done as a TV show. See, this is what he honestly felt. And you can see the love on the screen when uh, with the Arrow show and the Supergirl and you know, they just do it so right in flash. My God. Mm -hmm. Yes. They What's do. sort of strange, though, having uh, we we took a, a photo of the three of us together, uh, me, uh, Supergirl, and Flash, and I kept wanting to, but I just never said I killed you both. Yeah, no <laughs> it's, 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 it's exactly what I thought when I saw those photos. Yeah. <laughs> that's what uh one of our producers yeah, frank amazing said that to me <laughs> he goes he goes yeah that's cool he's like that's funny though he's kind of he's you know he's like that's funny because you know what and i'm like wait he's like you know those two characters were killed off i was like oh yeah that's right <laughs> that's a great that's a great meme there's a picture of them and then it's just 30 seconds later dot, yeah. dot, dot. and then Mark <laughs> smiling by himself <laughs> that's that's um, superb you so, know i have a, a funny story if i may um when we had gotten our first, we had a film deal with She, the first film deal we had. And uh, I had met with, I don't know if you know who, uh, uh, if you know Akiva Goldsman. Yeah, I've met him. He's a huge fan of yours. And he was like, I'm like, wow. So you're, you know, he had done Batman 4. I think it was, yeah, the fourth Batman. Oh, no, Batman and Robin he did. So um, I was like, you know, ask, just talking to him about comics and all. And, and he's like, and I'm like, wow. So, you know, why do you want to do this? And he goes, well, you know, I got to. And and he was he's like, you, you know, I think it's an interesting character, and but you know, and uh, but you know, I have a contract with with franchise pictures, and but what I really want to do is Teen Titans. <laughs> yeah, I know he wanted, uh, and he is. He's now on it. Um, you know, he was working on the live action show. It's funny because I read the uh, I wrote the theme park show for uh, Batman and Robin. I think uh, no, the one with Mister Freeze. Yeah, I think it's Batman and Robin, right? Um, yeah. And his script was so much better than the uh, than what we saw. I really liked what he did. Uh, he did a couple of really interesting things about Batman that just never made it to the uh, screen. Uh, I felt really bad because uh, uh, he had come up with a couple of really cool concepts. Mm -hmm. Well, he, have, he's, he this is 1999. I remember you telling me about that, Billy, that he was a big Marv fan. Yeah, and, and that he wanted, and I'm like, and he's like, yeah, well, yeah, good luck with that. Like, that'll ever happen, he said. Something like that. <laughs> little, little did we know, right? Little did we know, yeah. <laughs> I got. I want to I want to switch gears here for a minute because we are we are on the clock. Yeah. But in the late 90s, you and uh, Gene Colan teamed up for with at Dark Horse uh, on another take on Dracula, The Curse of Dracula. Uh, it was different, uh, uh, also a modern take. Um, did you guys have thoughts of doing more than the one miniseries, or was it always intended as a one-off? No, uh, uh, I think we both expected that it would continue, but it was a different type of um, uh, 
different market and it just didn't do well. Uh, Gene and I also did Night Force, uh, which, right. was, which was my attempt to try and do a completely different type of horror book, something that we hadn't seen before. And I love the book. I just totally love it. It has some of the best um, plotting and structure that, I, uh, that I've had on any book that I've ever worked on. Um, uh, it just didn't sell, I guess, that well. Yeah, there, there, there was a lot going on in the marketplace that had nothing yeah. to do with the with the the property when you guys did Curse of Dracula. Yeah. I was really happy to see a few years ago. Uh, I know, I think it was two thousand five that the trade paperback came out, but the uh, the hardcover is just beautiful. I actually keep it on my desk. Um, it's a beautiful looking book, and Gene did a great job with it. Yeah, and it, and it was it was one of those things that I, I look at all the time, like, you know, what if there was more because it was just, it was so enjoyable. Was there ever any film interested in that or did they miss the boat? Um, I own it. Uh, but I think because it didn't do that well, never showed it around. Uh, anybody could do Dracula. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in fact, I have a, an entire storyline that I want to do that would be completely different from anything anyone would ever have expected. Mm -hmm. um, and I may write it as a novel. Uh, we'll see. Oh, neat. Um, um, again, I'm sorry, now. No, that's fine. Go ahead, Billy. Um, uh, I'm curious. Something that I've always been curious about, and I, I wanted to ask you at dinner last uh, Sunday. Yes, I just name dropped that I had dinner with Marv Wolfman. <laughs> last Sunday uh, in Albuquerque, or is it Sunday no. before? Sunday before, yeah. but, uh, and, and your lovely wife, Noel. Um, question, uh, how, do you, how did you feel about the new 52? How do you feel about all this? The, I don't know, for some reason, it seems like the, the, a lot of these, you know, Marvel's doing it. A lot of these universe, like they're trying to copy what you did, right? you know, trying to capture that, like as Jeff has said, that lightning in the bottle. Um, Again, and, and maybe it's for sales the same way as what happened with you. But how do you feel about the various incarnations that they've done? Like, say, the, the New 52. You're going to hate my answer. You're going to tell me. I never read them. Oh, you never? You, so you don't even <laughs> I, I <laughs> that <don't>, answer. <laughs> I don't tend to read first uh, anything that people take over from me if I've created it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I never read anybody else's version of Titans. I had to finally read one or two of Jeff's, Jeff Johns's, because I was doing a, a storyline in that continuity. But otherwise, I never read what other people do with uh, my ideas of characters. In the case of Crisis, I just wasn't interested in reading anybody's. Mm. Uh, it's a lot of people keep asking me for my opinion on this because I've done it. Mm -hmm. And they're all friends in one way or another, good friends or uh, casual friends. And I have no. No, no dog in the race. Uh, I, you know, if I enjoy it, I enjoy it. If I don't, I don't. But it's mm -hmm. it's easier for me just not to bother. Yeah. yeah. One so of the things. Have, sorry, go ahead. Now. I'm just gonna. I've, we've got some super chats, so I just need to make sure I get these read off. Um, so we have a, a huge Titans fan, primarily Starfire, uh, Popfire, the Starfire Goddess. Um, you know, just hey, wants to let you know. You. <laughs> yes, yes. Every time it's always like, why is Star a uh, Starfire the best Titan? Um, do you feel Starfire is the best Titan? I, I, when people ask me who's my favorite Titan, I always say that's like asking somebody who's your favorite kid. <laughs> <laughs> it's not who I think is the best or the worst or, or whatever. It's what the readers do. I'm going to write the character the way I want to write her. And right. it's not, that's another reason why I don't bother checking. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. It's Pope I Fire, not Pop Fire. With somebody. Uh, yeah. To me, the view that I have is that so um, uh, I won't say. And then uh, uh, Pope Fire, the Starfighter guys, also says I, you know, I own almost every Starfire comic, including the cameos. Wow. Um, some call it a problem; I call it a solution. Over <laughs> over four long boxes. Um, that's amazing to, to to you know touch readers like that. And I, we just got another one from Scarlet Crusader. Says this, so this is an amazing been, one. I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for so many great stories. When I had leukemia in the 80s, I was in isolation for two years. Your work kept me dreaming and fighting to live. Very grateful. Wow. wow. That's a, you get, that's what makes it all worthwhile, all mm -hmm. the hard work. No wow. kidding. Yeah. We don't that do, gave me goosebumps. That's, yeah. that's incredible. <laughs> uh, we do it to tell good stories. 
And I get so many people coming to me and telling me the story of how it affected them. And you feel so good. It's, it's impossible to explain how you come out feeling. It's just absolutely wonderful. I'm so glad. I mean, it's, it is amazing. You know, all, all three of you here that are, are, are on the show tonight, you know, Marv, JC, uh, Billy, I mean, that that's crazy. That that's must be one of the best feelings to create these universes where, you know, many people have problems. They escape into, you know, books and stories and you, you are creating escapism that helps people forget about certain things. Some is just enjoying it, but others you're giving them somewhere to go for however long it takes them to read that book. As I say, you, don't, you don't know you're doing that. You're just trying to tell a story, but these things do have an effect on people. And mm -hmm. it's, it's so wonderful because I keep hearing about people who are in bad situations and something they read of mine or even another writer or whatever, uh, was able to pull them through, make them hold on a little bit longer until they were able to get past it. Um, it's just wonderful. Uh, mm -hmm. No way to, I can't write that well to explain what I feel. Mm. Yeah. That's great. Wow. Well, great it's, it's truly, it's truly, it's truly an amazing thing to witness. We, and, you know, working on the Overstreet Price Guide, we hear these stories from people about what their favorite ones were and, you know, the creator that they've met at a, at a convention, maybe that same convention. Uh, we hear that a lot. You go by Billy's table and you'll see somebody showing him his, ta their tattoo of she, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's just things, things that it's impossible to imagine it happening yeah. even as a writer. And yet when it does, it's, it, I think it's so humbling. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a great feeling. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it's funny because like with the films now, and I remember like my wife, you know, you know, she cried three times during Wonder Woman, you know, and she comes out, she's like, I cried three times. And I'm like, that's what it's like reading a comic book. You should read comic books. <laughs> the same thing with, you know, in, um, in, in, uh, what's we call it? The, uh, what's it? Oh God. What's the, the, what's the last Marvel film? The last Avengers film? Marvel? Endgame. Endgame. At Endgame when Captain America was standing there alone. With the light on them, you know what I mean. Before the portal opened, yeah. and you're like, you know, and and they're like, oh my god, that scene oh, yeah. is so great. I'm like, <laughs> man, read some comics. You want to get that feeling, you know, weekly. You know, pick up, What's you know, there's some this great com. And if you don't like anything new, grab the old showcases. Grab the old, you know, it's it's what a an inexpensive way of escaping and something that you can have forever. Oh yeah, you know, that's why I feel that comics. I think comics are always gonna be on paper. I they're, always, they, I, they're always gonna yeah i think they'll yeah. always be on paper and i don't you know people are like oh the industry's going down blah blah, blah. no it's the comics will always be around one of my they're, one of my one of my around. best lessons very early in my career came from murphy anderson when he told me that comics had been dead seven times in his career <laughs> <laughs> i i could see a time when they don't publish monthly uh but publish the publish first the collected editions mm -hmm. and like a novel like a hardcover novel come out with the hardcover the whole thing and then a, a less expensive version a year later uh mm -hmm. the series of uh comics but i the the collected editions are just so gorgeous yeah and what did you what did when what did you think when you saw the uh the new teen titans omnibus was that just it was just i was so i was so geeked out by that <laughs> Thing. Now I, I'm thinking more in terms of like I mentioned Man and Superman. Yeah. Um and it was supposed to be four four individual issues, but they uh, never came out as, as that. So it was uh, its first printing was all four issues together. The story reads better if you read all of them together. And that's why I would love to see more collected editions being the first printing. So you could mm -hmm. tell the story and you don't have to keep the emotion going a month until the next chapter comes out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. For, for those things to happen. If the novel came out first and then a year later you bring out the paperback version, I think you could at least, people could read the story the, main, the way it's meant to be read as one, yeah. not as uh, let's do a little bit and wait a month. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. And uh, we got we had another super chat in from Pope Fire Starfire. It said, "Same. I grew up in an abusive home. 
uh, helped a lot, uh, helped a lot. My first was a Judas contract I used to bust tables just to get some tip money to pick up comics. Um, <laughs> <laughs> of course, you have to tell the story. You had to yeah. Tell the story. And then uh, Wyatt Holiday, uh, he's one of our moderators. Uh, he says, "Thank you for writing the Return of Optimus Prime as well. A major highlight of many a childhood." Well, thank you. Now, you know, Billy, you were speaking of you know like Endgame and things like that. You know, we had Crisis and whatnot. I mean. Uh, is that you, you think kind of like that whole that story arc of just all of that, you know, like the end is coming and thing, you know, the, the mighty powers involved, you know, do, do you think crisis kind of set that stepping stone for, you know, like infinity gauntlet type oh. stories? Oh, absolutely. I don't think there would be any of those. Uh, Jeff, how about you? Do you think, you know, I, I don't. I, you know, what's really funny. I, I think that success has always spawned imitators and that's, that's the that's the nature of things. I wish that the level of imitation was uh, was up to the level of the stuff that Marv put into Crisis. Right. Um, I do notice that when we with success, we also tend to get derivative. Like almost all of the major events at DC since then have used the word crisis. In one yeah. <laughs> yes, they have. They have. <laughs> Yeah. We didn't come up with that crisis on Earth. Yeah, title that that was the Justice League with uh, Julie Schwartz. Um, I think crisis has just been usurped by DC, and they own the word now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like Marvel with the letter X. It's pretty much yeah. exactly. Um, yeah. So we got another good question here. Um, Heron Burr uh, at Crowdfunding Comics. Marvin Carmine wrote Dial H for Hero in Adventure Comics. All of the characters were submitted by readers. Totally interactive. How did they pick the submissions? Uh, I, wow. I would go through all the envelopes uh, once a month and take the one for what we're trying to do. Sure. Uh, somebody else's idea, do something else with it. So I tried to keep it interesting. But um, I was a writer, and my goal was to find all the cool characters, the fun characters. That's phenomenal. Awesome. That's uh, that's so cool, like an interactive thing. I've always wanted to submit those things back. No one does that anymore. No, and you got a shirt. If your character, like, well, we weren't going to do anything. And I said, no, you have to do something. You have to give them something. <laughs> Let's do a special crisis T-shirt. You got a horn over there, Billy? Jeez. Um, I, my allergies. If it, Get the guy a meatball. Come on. No, if you know, we had to go. Um, we had a, a major flood, and we went to Home Depot today to pick out tiles. The guy finally yeah. came. And I don't know if you've ever been in the tile aisle of a Home Depot or a Lowe's or a tile place. Went to another tile. Just the dust. You know what I mean? That's on all the porcelain tiles. and the, eh. So I'm dying. I'm dying here. No, oh, we got another. Uh, let's see. Sorry, I think we got One, another, yeah, another uh, super chat. Super chat. Yeah, they're really coming in now. Huh. Um, now that we're over time, I know now that yeah. we're over time. Sorry, Marv. Yeah. Um, Miss Wolfman, thank you for the countless hours of magic you provide. I hope you can feel the love here. Uh, what was it about the '80s that made comics so special? And do you think that will ever be captured again? God bless. Uh, I think we all, no matter what our age is, we love the stuff that we were growing up with. Um, so I have a very fond memory of the stuff that comes out in the 60s and 70s. Yeah, I could read it now as a professional and go, oh my God, this makes no sense. But uh, back then I just loved it. And I think people now are looking back at the 80s and the 90s and, they go, and they're gonna to gravitate towards the best of those books. And in 20 years, they'll go look back at this year and start to like um, start to talk about those being the best because it's the best that you feel that affects you the most. And when mm -hmm. you're in that age group, that's when you're affected the most by by different material. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a, there is a very big nostalgia factor. It's not an obvious one, but it's good. yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's great. <laughs> well, you know, you know, it's funny because you guys were the first generation. Of fans who started writing comics. I mean, yeah. you grew up with them. You loved them so much that it hurt. You know what I mean? And and but that also bred that you were able to kill them all. You know, I mean, but you know, you killed your shit, you know, and, and you know, every writer's like you said, 
Not yeah. everyone were alive to begin with. Yeah. The drawings, and so I didn't kill anybody. <laughs> I mangled some uh, captains and, and dialogue. <laughs> Now, before, I know we, we're going to get going. I told you we'd be about an hour. Just one thing we didn't really touch base on, and that is, um, you know, you've helped create a lot of characters. Um, is there one character that, you know, I know you said, you know, it's like being a, a parent, you know, a parent with the children. But is there one character that sticks with you? One that you're like, man, I just love that character. They're all intended for different reasons. And again, I'm not trying to um, be humble or trying to, but, you know, there, if the character solves the problem that I'm that I need solved, that that means the character is working well. So Deathstroke, he worked out perfectly. He was a character I came up with literally in a second. Mm -hmm. Same with Blade, uh, Black Hat. I worked on Raven and Ty and Starfire and all of those characters. I worked on. They took a while to come out. Each one of the characters saw, was brought in to solve a need. And when they start to be, uh, not only solve the need, but add a lot more to it, because you start seeing all the possibilities with the character, it's working beautifully. And first characters I like. There are characters I did that I thought people would love that nobody cared about whatsoever. Uh, mm -hmm. Just like Torpedo in, in Daredevil. Torpedo, Torpedo I thought was going to be. I am the Torpedo fan. <laughs> <laughs> I love that character. Bullseye. You know, I didn't know Bullseye would be as big a sensation as I he's love Bullseye. Yeah. You know. That's great. And I love you know, Nova. I'm a huge Nova fan too. Oh yeah, man. But he goes back to my fans and so he goes back to when I was 14, 15, and 16. Oh, really? Is he one of really? your Can... comic characters is Yeah. That's wow. great. That's great. Oh. You did know, you draw him? Because you, I'm sorry. Because no. that was uh, when did Nova first come out? Was it 76 or 70? When when was the uh, issue one? Some place around 76. 76, 76, 76, 77, 77 right? Something like that. September 19. I don't remember exactly. What inspired Nova? Like, well, because you said that that's from your back in the back in your uh, early days. Yeah, yeah. The, well, that was uh, that was near my the end of my run at Marvel. Mm -hmm. uh, I was there for those were my last couple of years at Marvel, so it'll be 78, 79. Mm -hmm. Now you said you you wanted to draw. You said is that is that what you said earlier? You wanted to now. So did you go to school for art or anything like that? And yeah, I majored in art at high school of art and design. Majored in cartooning. Uh, I was an art. I actually was an art teacher in junior high school. I had a mm -hmm. uh, that was my degree, and I wrote stories primarily to have something to draw. Wow. Uh, there you go. My yeah. art was never, I could never do what I wanted to with my art. Uh, I could not get the characters to do all the different things I wanted them to, but I could manage to make it work in writing. Mm -hmm. And eventually I finally said, I'm obviously not an artist, mm -hmm. but all the art training makes it really good as a comic book writer or as mm -hmm. a writer or any type of right. writer, you have to think visually and having that uh, the love for the art for doing art I think helped me learn how to write visually so my stories aren't just talking heads mm -hmm. now did you draw right. when you when you came up with with Nova say when you were young did you draw him do you have these original drawings like character sketches or anything like that like you know like yeah. like you know some of the, some of the characters that you created did you well, you know, not only just come up with in your head, you know, Deathstroke, did you start designing him? Because I'm sure I, you still drew, right? I agree. Uh, most of the time, I would describe it to artists. Uh, one or two occasions, I may do a rough sketch. I don't want, my art isn't creative enough or good enough, certainly at this point, that uh, I want to hem in an artist. I think mm -hmm. you have to give them as much free space to run and tell the great story. I will tell them exactly what my what my thought process was, and what I want with a character. But let them design it. Uh, only a very few of mine uh, have ever um, really uh, that I very few have been designed by me. Mm -hmm. hmm. Now we have a, a this has come up. I've been seeing in the chat a little bit, so I want to get to it uh, real quick. 
Um, it says that at Crowdfund Comics, please ask Marv to tell the story of how he got his credit for DC's House of Secrets 83. Oh, God. Can't they just look up my... Uh, <laughs> 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 there. I've told this story like 18 million times. Essentially, um, uh, there were interstitials, pages before each of the horror stories at the House of Mystery, House of Secrets, and the host character was telling uh, telling the reader what they're going to expect. Jerry Conway, who wrote, uh, who wrote them, uh, knew that the, uh, the next story was mine, was what are my stories. And so he had the character of Abel say something to the effect of the following story was told to me by a wandering wolfman. It was just being funny. Yeah. I was doing it. The comic code at that point did not allow werewolf or wolfman or any of that stuff. And the code said, you, can, well, you can't publish us. They said, that's his name. If it's actually his name, you have to give him a credit. Uh, that way, it's not a per it's not a monster; it's a person. They did. Uh, they sent a patch uh, to uh, the printer, and the printer booted in place, and um, uh, we got the book published. Right there, to my so which you cannot see, is the original artwork for that for the. The page that has my name on it, the very first credit that I ever received. That's great. That's cool. cool. <laughs> there. Oh, there it is. Can, there. can, you expand yeah, gonna, it on? can we zoom in on it? Yeah, there we go. There we go. Yeah. Wow. So, stuff that dreams are made of, and the credit is right over there. That's just that's awesome. awesome. Fantastic. You know, that's really, that's, that's really good. I, uh, uh, I think about the, the the small stuff like that. That was by Alex Toth, and you could not ask for a better artist. Oh my gosh! Oh. I mean, how do you? You can't even make that up. Mm -hmm. you know? no, I <laughs> yeah, I mean, seriously, that's amazing. I, I, Alex Alex Toth. Let's see. <laughs> uh, it's the, the the small stuff. The the little stories like that are are, are the fun thing. First first page of original artwork I ever bought was Deathstroke by Steve Irwin. Well, Steve did a and uh, Deathstroke was one of my favorites um, because he had so much more depth and so many more layers than people would have expected. And we we introduced family. We introduced everything for him. Uh, that's because I never saw him as a villain. And <laughs> as a villain, it, it's, you can do a much stronger story, I think. It, 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 was, it was very well-rounded. One of the things, one of the things I loved about about Steve's artwork on it is he he had, his perspective was really interesting. He did a uh, we shopped at the same retailer ceiling tile that was Deathstroke pulling back the ceiling tile <laughs> right over the cash register in this store. And it I, I I went to that store for years and I looked at it every single time I was there. Ah, uh, so that's where I got his reference from. Steve <laughs> <laughs> was great. Oh, God, I'd love to work with him again. Mm -hmm. Now, do you and George still stay in touch? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're still friends. Uh, we saw each other, uh, I guess, at Dragon Con, but uh, occasionally he comes out to LA for stuff and we get together, uh, have dinner or something of that sort. Now, now, someone had asked previously, it was probably, I would say, before we hit the top of the hour, um, you know, would you ever, have you ever considered uh, retiring like George did, or are you just going to keep on trucking along? Well, uh, first of all, George retired because he had medical problems. Mm -hmm. He retired because he wanted to retire. Um, that's much sadder. I wish he had retired because he wanted to. Uh, he just couldn't do it. And I hope that I can continue until I don't want to. Mm -hmm. mm. We do too. And you will. Yes. <laughs> Hopefully, you never want to stop. <laughs> <laughs> You have to hire me. I can't do it. Uh, now, now are you, do you have anything in the works that you can talk about? Um, the only two books, uh, two stories that I did that are coming out, uh, I did them just before the end of the year. I did a Flash story for one of their 100 pagers. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a big, wacky story, really wacky. Um, and I did a Robin story, which is actually – in my, in my continuity, taking place just before the very first time you ever see Nightwing. Oh, oh cool. Right. cool. Prior to the origin of Nightwing. 
Wow. That's great. I'm going to keep an eye out for that. <laughs> yeah. That. What, what will that be in? Work on my uh, novel or something. Very nice. What will that be in, that Robin story? I think it's the Robin's 70th anniversary or 80th anniversary. 80th, 80th anniversary, yeah. Uh, oh, so perfect. And it was drawn by Tom Grummet. And he did oh, it. nice. Nice. Uh, he did a beautiful job with it. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. All right, do you guys have any other uh, further questions? We, we've now exceeded we're an hour and 15 minutes. Yeah, um, we, I don't know if you had any. We've taken enough of yeah. Marv's time. But <laughs> yeah, I we've got a million of them, but yeah. <laughs> I, I, I got to say, uh, you know, I've enjoyed every time I've been on the show with you guys, but this is my favorite episode by far. Uh, same mean, here. This is definitely yeah. taking the cake for me. It's hard to, I'll tell you, Marv, it's really hard to host a show when when your guest starts talking and you forget you're hosting a show and you're just sitting listening yeah um <laughs> so that must mean that you definitely had a great guest on i'll tell you that much um and, and we're getting such you know all the all the viewers out there and the fans are just they're, they're in love with what you're doing the work they want you to keep going and there's just so much positivity out there in the live chat right now yeah more um is it where will you be appearing uh this uh, i'm sorry I said I'm not, I don't intend to wear out my welcome. <laughs> Marv, um, where will you be appearing this year? Do you have any convention, convention uh, coming up or store signings or anything? Uh, the the next one I believe is WonderCon, and I should know this. Let's see, because I just printed out a list of where I'm going to be, but I, I can't find it. Um, the next one is WonderCon. I know I have a convention. In, uh, a whole bunch of them coming up. Uh, I just can't remember what they are right now. And they, but they can go to marvwolfman.com. No, they can't. Oh, no. uh, my website it's up there, but I cannot. Uh, the software all got screwed up, and I uh, I cannot change it. I can't fix it. So uh, unfortunately, because Apple won't has gotten rid of iWeb. And oh, if yeah. not, so I can't access my stuff anymore. Oh, well, you know, now you knows how to fix this. Please come by. <laughs> well, this is where we can say, okay, boomer, because you are one of the very first baby boomers. I am literally the first. Yeah. <laughs> uh, nine months after World War II, I was born exactly nine months to the day after World War II. Wow. Why <laughs> <laughs> you really are? As for, uh, as for uh, what is it, Boomer again? Um, but okay, Boomer, they say. Yeah, okay, Boomer. They should only wish. Yeah, you go, buddy. <laughs> Amen. Amen, brother. <laughs> well, this has been fantastic. Uh, this has been wonderful. Great. This has been great. I've had I, this is so I'm, uh, so much fun. I'm so I'm so honored to have you on, Marv. Thank you for taking yeah. the time out of your day. Really appreciate this. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you so much. So everyone, we will be back next week, uh, Tuesday, nine p.m. Um, and I will start promoting those as well. Um, but now to keep, are you active on Twitter or anything like that? Do you post uh, anything? Yeah, I'm. I uh twitter and facebook okay and Wolfman. all right fantastic so yeah. if you want to follow um ev everything marf has going on make sure that you can uh, like his facebook he has a facebook page you can like and uh, you can follow him on twitter at marv wolfman you take care marv, you too. Been wonderful thank you so much it's a real honor <laughs> sir it really is take all care right. have a great one marv thank you all right good night guys all right. good night not yet, everyone. Not yet, John. Oh, not yet. Oh, not oh. yet. Not yet. You know, we've got a, you know, we're at the, we've got, you know, a few things going on. And I think, uh, you know, it's a bit of a, a reminder out there. Right, Billy? What's what's there to remind? That there's still an in-demand going on. Across oh, is that for, is that, is that, is that for She Return of the Warrior? I would say so, wouldn't you? Oh, look at you. Too kind, my friend. You know what? We haven't played the video in a long time. Can we play the video? Sure. <laughs> He's like, no. Hey, it's John too long. Cimino. John Cimino, too. <laughs> John, if you're still here, we have to have you on our show. Yeah, we, we want to have you and Roy on. Come on. John Cimino and Roy Thomas, we want you guys on our show. Yes. So I'm going to reach out to you, buddy. All right. I'll myself, you. Billy, and, that and Mr. JC. Oh, you know if you oh you know you'll be there, JC. Yeah. 
But yeah, play so, my, yeah, play my video, old chum. Let's play the video for for all time's sake, huh? Why not? Yeah, because we, we have a big announcement coming tomorrow anyway. Fantastic. <laughs> Hello everyone, Billy Tucci here, and I am so proud and so excited to announce the 21-day debut campaign for our all-new 48-page graphic novel, She Return of the Warrior. That's right, after 15 years, she's back, baby! In Return of the Warrior, we now find our heroine, Anna Ishikawa, 15 years removed from when she last graced the pages of a comic book. With her warrior days far behind her, Anna is divorced from her husband, disgraced NYPD detective Peter Denise, and now lives a peaceful, quiet existence raising their teenage daughter, Hotaru. But all that changes when Dr. Yu, a character that will be named after one of our backers, brings the terrifying news that Masahiro Arashi has escaped from a New York City mental institution. Her former antagonist, now suffering from dementia, has regressed back to his younger, more violent self, and is vengefully obsessed with the one person responsible for his incarcerated existence, Anna Ishikawa. Manhattan is once again gripped in fear as a series of gruesome copycat chi killings resurface, with the order of victims proving ever closer to Anna. A desperate Anna must now, alongside Dr. Yu, seek out and stop Arashi before he can fulfill his murderous destiny. A destiny whose road ends with her own daughter, Hotaru. On Return of the Warrior, I am joined by co-writer Stephen Peros, co-artist Ricardo Silva, colorist Brian Miller, and designer Mindy Lopkin. In addition, we've got a host of fun variant covers supplied by myself, superstar Amanda Connor, Connie Valentina, and Mike Renzini. And as a very special bonus, the legendary George Perez has gracefully come out of retirement to provide one last and unforgettably beautiful she cover. It has been over a quarter century since she first debuted on the comic book shelves. And after three Eisner Award nominations, five languages, and three million comics in print, it is truly a privilege to bring you a new story with a character that has aged, matured, and progressed with time. <laughs> I got to tell you, I get so emotional seeing the lioness within Anna Ishikawa resurface as she once again takes up the Naginata. And you too will see a reawakening as a mother literally turns back time, transforms the hunted into the hunter, and unsheaths the return of the warrior. Again, thank you all. Please pledge. Please share. Peace, love, comics. And remember, she is back. Have that that's it she's back so yeah, right she's now back, baby she is back so look at us scala and old bean this is uh of course jeffrey vaughn our editor thank you uh now scala put that video together i would just like to say the, the video is really awesome except for one part what part what part and it's not technical so it's nothing niall did wrong <laughs> You said she literally turns back time. I did not say that. You did. No, I didn't. I did. She literally turns back time. I'm like, no, it's not. Uh, it's well, not I said that. I, I was just thinking. I, said, I know somebody it's didn't run that by the. Hour. I wish we That's could turn back, back time because we just spent an awesome hour hour with Marv Wolfman. Yes, we did. That was, that was, was the all, fastest all hour. I've been I've been privileged to be on the show with you guys a bunch of times. I've really enjoyed every single one of them, but man. 
I love talking to great comics creators. Yeah. Well, I know. Yeah. It, it was, it was one, it, it was, so, you know, and it, we're all in awe and that's how it was again, you know, I got to keep looking because I keep dropping these names, but having dinner with Marv and Larry Hama uh, two weeks ago. Yeah, and, it, uh, it, 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 we, were, we were talking about this before the show and, and, and it really is one of the greatest things uh, because at the shows you tend to be working, you hope you're busy. Um, if you're, if you're not busy, then you got a whole thing going on. Right. Yeah. Uh, and you know, we've been to a, we, Billy, you and I have been to a few shows where we could have been bowling in the aisles uh yeah at times yeah uh, and so you really hope you're busy but it's those meals and 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 conversations afterward where you really get to know people and find out about their families and yeah. how they got started and and the great the greatest thing about comics and we've talked about this since the very first show if you go out there and do your crowdfunded comic and you're sitting next to a marv wolfman or a Don McGregor, or a Jim Shooter, or any of these guys that did the comics that were so formative to us. If they like your comic, you're you're suddenly you're a peer with those guys. Yeah. If we go out there, if we go out there and we make a great indie film, we're not hanging out with Spielberg. Yeah, mm -hmm. comics are so egalitarian. Yeah, it, it and, and aside from being one of the great American art forms like jazz comics uh, comics just are so absolutely egalitarian it's something that it's phenomenal that you can say that this guy you know and you know we've we've all had these things where these people who were so influential to us are our friends yeah i know i know mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, and that's the same thing, you know, it's and then you, and you are in, so you publish your book, you're in, yeah. the book. you know, you are in it because, you know, that happened to me. So, you know, I met Chris, I met Chris Claremont and he's yeah. like, yeah, I read your book. I'm like, what? Yeah. Like, yeah, I, I, re I remember, I remember, I remember when you told me Chris Claremont was going to write the forward to one of the trades. Yeah. The first trade. Yeah. yeah. And, and I was like, Chris Claremont, how much <laughs> do you have to pay him? But, no, he wanted to do it. Yeah, you know, it's crazy. And then someone said, yeah, we saw Jim Lee was reading your comic at the Diamond Retailer Summit. He was at a, you know, in the green room or something yeah. reading it. My, and I'm like, what, what? You know, so then I'm like, hey, so they let me open the door and like, hey, you know, good to see you. And they see that you could do it. And yeah. what's great about now is that we all can do this. This is, I, 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 like I, say, I don't, I don't really want to, I, I don't want to harp on it, but I don't think we can say it enough. If you do the work, and the work doesn't mean just writing the comic. It means writing the best comic you possibly can. Yeah. These guys are these. They, they, listen, they, you can find snooty people in every in every oh, yeah. business in yeah. every field. But comics, man, the the guys that do this the best, if you do a great job, are going to look at it and go, "Hey, man, that's cool." Yeah. Well, you know, especially now, if you, you know, publish it, they will come. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly. It. <laughs> you got to buy some drink. You got to believe and you got to do the work and nobody yeah. owes you any. Yeah. Well, boys, this was fantastic. Well said, JC. Well said. This was great. And we got to get on John Samino. I'm going to email John. And if we get John and Roy on, Roy Thomas, for those I guys. Yeah, Roy yeah. Thomas. Yeah. Sit opposite Roy at one of those kind of convention dinners that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, uh, aside, this is even before he was publishing Alter Ego again. Uh, the guy has so much history comics history oozing out of his pores you can't help but learn something yeah yeah and that's how it was with you know with larry hama too you know yeah and and and, and larry knows so many people and ha and is uh i mean larry in in one sense is an old-fashioned editor because he can pencil he can write he can do yeah. he can do all this stuff and he can tell you how to do it better yeah mm -hmm. yeah oh yeah and you know and, and, and there's a story from one of the shows last year that there was no green room you know like for for the at the comic con for the comic creators and then larry's like you know i where can i get a cup of coffee and they're like no there's no green room and he's like oh but there's a green room for third zombie on the left of episode seven of walking you know uh, of uh of four of walking dead and he goes i have a bigger acting resume than him <laughs> you know? and he does he does he's on mash <laughs> <laughs> He, well, yeah, that's right. Yes. He played a Yakuza he was, boss in um in in Bloodshot. So you know? 
this. It's like, what? <laughs> can you get a cup of coffee? So we got to, we, so uh, we're talking to Larry now. Uh, mm -hmm. He looks like he's in, right, Nile? So, so far, he, he's just, uh, so well, I'll just let you guys know if it all works out, he will be our guest next week, uh, Thursday at nine. Um, but he's working us, he's got to confirm it. Yeah. So as of right now, it's looking pretty good. Um, if not, we do I have a backup guest. A spork. What's that? You're going to be interviewing a spork. Yeah. I thought it was a foon. Foon. But we do have a, another guest lined up. Yeah, who will be a future guest, but they're like, yeah, I can, I'm flexible. So yeah. he's, he's slated for uh, two weeks after that. I was but, flexible uh, when I was younger. Very flexible. Up, up. Put his, all right, well, I got to go to bed. Good night, gentlemen. Guys, Good this night, is gentlemen. Listen, uh, if I may pitch my own book, uh, tomorrow we'll be sending did. out a, a new um, emails. We've got a, a, a new art, original art uh, rewards coming up. People have been asking me about it. So I'm like, you know what? Ooh. I'll throw it up there. Why not? Nice. Um, and, uh, and what? And right now, with our No Fan Left Behind campaign, thank you all very much. We're at We're over $142,000. And our, uh, our Indiegogo just passed by over a thousand dollars now it passed it relatively quickly uh our indiegogo campaign surpassed our kickstarter campaign well, by over a thousand dollars so thank you all each and every one of you thank you guys so much it's just you guys have you you ain't seen nothing yet we're doing pages we've got panels uh that i'm working on roughs let me see. Let me throw something. Oh, show bring you. it, bring up, bring up, Niall, bring up the, uh, bring up Billy showing the roughs. Come on, Billy, show some of those roughs. <laughs> I just show them. Yeah, let me show you. I'll show you the ones that I'm doing now that are going to be inked. And I really love working like this. I got to tell you. So here's a scene, and we're we're re reintroducing Peter Denise. Your roughs are Dr. Blevins, Pete's in jail, and he's kind of crazy. Have fun in and jail. You know, yeah, and there's yeah, Anna, you know, and and uh, look at Arashiyama. Look at that. Uh, Arashiyama is now owned by one of the biggest search and en uh, exits, one of the biggest uh, search engines, which is like our Google, I guess. And uh, oh, and then I have you know Pete going a little crazy, but lots of fun stuff. I can also show something. Very cool. I got a bunch of them. Then we'll start inking them up. I mean, you know, pages obviously are already being inked and everything. I would just. But if can I can I add something here now? Yeah, it'll work yes. Uh, I just uh, as long as we're pitching our stuff while Billy's looking through the pages. Uh, uh, be bedtime stories for impressionable children number two is in the January previews. It's a little late to order, but mm -hmm. it is still wide open for reorders, and we could use the support. Tell your yeah. retailer you want it. It was on page two fifty three of the January previews, and also uh, we have the two thousand twenty edition of the Overstreet Guide to Collecting, uh, which is our free comic book day offering with a cover by Mr. Tucci and colored by the great Wes Hartman, uh, featuring Painkiller Jane and Yosagi Yojimbo in the, yeah. team up you, in the team up you will never see in the comic. Yeah. <laughs> we'll post those on Twitter. So that, oh, that would be great. That. Thank let's you very much. So email me what you, you know, what we can see. Obviously, there's a limit with it and we want to tag a few people. But if you got a little advert, we'll put it in with the Twitter. Perfect. Perfect. And and uh, Scala, how's things going with uh, Medico? Oh, it's rocking and rolling. It's a little slow right now, but we got to get back on it. Me and Frank, amazing. All right. Well, that's why we got to start making our shows an hour, so we can. Yeah, we we almost work. that. Well, I don't know though. I mean, if we keep having guests like that, I we could have easily gone another hour. I, know, I just I know. know. <laughs> I just know. I told him not. You know, we try not to exceed the hour. Yeah. You know, because he was he, he tried was tried and failed. We tried and if, if, that's not bad. Fifteen minutes over. I mean, Jesus. No, now considering what an amazing considering, guy. Some, considering some of the uh, considering some of the early shows, like around hour three, you'd be getting into the topic. <laughs> well, we've got to ask George Perez on, and get George Perez, and then have Marv as a as a special guest host. And bring them on for even 10, 15 minutes and just have them be, go back and be yeah, like it would, it would be it would be fun and and particularly uh given George's history of these great team ups, uh everything, you know, new, new Teen Titans, Avengers, Crisis, all that. I think one of the most amazing things that uh, that I've ever seen is I think you know, like Marv was talking about DC uh, the Marvel kids, what we thought of Superman being boring and and it's wrong really superman's the greatest character of all time 
but in the hands of bad writers is boring as all get out. Oh yeah. That, oh, of okay? course. Yeah. Right. So of one of the greatest things ever was I've, I've always thought that Starro is the most stupid villain ever created in comics. Right. Okay. But when Kurt Busiek and George did Avengers GLA and in one of the Marvel issues, Starro is actually freaking scary. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, perfect. Starro is only scary in a Marvel comic. And it took <laughs> and it took George to do it visually. Yeah. 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 You know. Well, maybe there's some there's hope for Fang Fang Foom. You know, there are an awful lot of artists <laughs> that love that character. I know. Fing Fang Foom and 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 Black Manta. My God. Oh well, let's not Black let Manta. Do, do, do. Billy no, and I, Billy and I have the best Black Manta story ever. We Just do. Don't, we, we don't do. think anybody's ever going to let us do it. No, they won't. It would be so. It would be huge. It would be huge. So. so Anyway, anyway, so, uh, anyway, I think we've got a lot of exciting stuff coming on. Uh, yep. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think the show itself is 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 gaining momentum, and people should subscribe to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and by the way, click like, please, if you enjoyed tonight's please. show. Yes. Uh, and I think if you didn't enjoy tonight's show, what's wrong with you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of great guests lined up. Big oh, stars. So many. And and also right, Scala, a lot of new creators. Who are mm -hmm. who are following their crowdfunding comics dream that we're going to be uh, giving them? Uh, I think one of us might have thrown the word egalitarian out there. I, I can't remember yeah. who. Oh, but yeah, yeah. but it, that's that's the thing here. I mean, if we can go if we can go from uh, alterna comics to Marv Wolfman, man, we're covering some stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. It's been great. And what's what you what you know what's been be the best part about doing this show though is the guests that we've had on actually contact to come back on like i want to come back on you know we've got some people and, and what's awesome too with now using Streamyard, which i was not you know me i was a bit stubborn i liked my my setup and being more creative and whatnot a little bit of a snob yes <laughs> but now with this system it's great because i can literally schedule this show now and people are going to see it next week it's going to be like a real like talk radio show obviously with a yeah. video but you know we're going to have a guest from you know the start of the show to the top of an hour and from the top of an hour to an end of an hour and you know we're going to have people coming in and out you know this way we can the the demand to be on the show is it's 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 wonderful. overwhelming yeah. and overwhelmingly wonderful let me put it that way you know you know it, it's what's really great is i'm just looking at the little pictures here of marv's covers <coughs> He, he, he mentioned night force uh, mm -hmm. but you know one of the things that one of the things I we really should have asked him about you see you've got machine man there right yep. yeah okay Kirby's run a machine man uh, I like it a lot better now than I did as a kid as a matter of fact I love it now and uh, mm -hmm. I, 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 unlike some of Kirby's later Marvel stuff I, I hated the Captain America when I was a kid I love it now mm hmm his Black Panther interrupted McGregor's Black Panther, and I and I never I never have liked it. But um, that Machine Man came. It came like Machine Man was canceled for like a couple months, and then you know when Kirby left, mm -hmm. and they brought it back, and it was Marv and Ditko. Mm. It was oh, so right. it was so good. It only yes. lasted a few months. But you, you can get in a trade paperback that has the Kirby stuff in. I was just I was actually just telling stuff. Billy that earlier today. It's phenomenal, I man. I, I I forgot Marv worked with Ditko. Yeah, and well, okay. So Steve Ditko <coughs> birthday. Uh so his he died he passed away on June 29th, coming up two years. Yeah. We should have a show and we can have all these people because there are so many people that work with him. We can see if Marv will come back on, Larry Hama. You know, shooter. Like, yeah, I was trying to get shooter. Steve work. You yeah. know what I mean? You know, we get we who would you say it'll be? Shooter. Shooter. We can get them and have a, a celebration of Steve Ditko because he his birthday's 1927. You know, and I think one of the things I think one of the great things uh about this is you know, like we could get we could get uh um uh Dan and Josh Braun who own Creepy. Mm -hmm. You know, they published through Dark Horse, and the minute they did the Bernie Wrightson book of selecting just Bernie's stories. I started calling them, like literally calling them and saying they had to do the Ditko book. They had it on the schedule, but I think they moved it up just to have me stop calling. 
All right. Well, this is fantastic. Yeah. I got to go to bed. I got a lot of drawing to do tomorrow, and I got to write a press release and send out updates to all of our Indiegogo and Kickstarter backers. Thank you guys out there. And uh, Johnny, look, my uh, Anthony Vito said, John, get Ramita, get Johnny Senior on. That would be awesome, John. He just did. He just turned ninety. I think he's ninety. John. Maybe we get Senior and Junior on. Yeah, I get. I get Johnny on. That'd be that would be great. Would be let's fun, let's man. face it. Let's I face think it. One of the things we want to things... cook for them, and then they'll come. I over. was just telling Frank, amazing that I was looking at you know because I I started reading all the Spider Mans again, right? And every now and then I'll do that. You know, I'll start at one, and sure. at, every night I read one book before bed. And uh, I was just looking at Ramita's Spider Man stuff, and I was like, you know, I think this is my favorite. It it you I, know what's what, what's really funny uh, is I was uh, definitely in the Ramita camp uh, as a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, I love I love Ditko on Doctor Strange, mm -hmm. but once I discovered Ditko's black and white horror artwork, my appreciation of the guy just went went to a whole nother level. If you guys haven't seen that creep that no, that, I'm not that, familiar that, with that, not the familiar collection with of his creepy yeah. work. Oh my gosh, it, it is it is a freaking revelation. And and the greatest thing the greatest thing about this, what are we doing? We we tried to and we we tried. <laughs> We tried to end the show like 20 minutes ago, and we yeah. keep talking. I, well, this is what our after shows are like, right? Yes. You know what this I mean? Is what, yeah, you guys are for an an hour. You're being a part of our crowdfunding comics after show. Yep, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> 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 yeah, Johnny, Johnny Sr., uh, John Sr., uh, his birthday was January 24th. Yeah. Yeah. God so it was just last week. God and and, and, and well, Chris Claremont uh, said he would come on the show too, not to yes, interrupt you there. Yes, he well, I think I think that would be great because you know he's such a guy, nice guy. Talk so, about so, a guy who we wish was doing more work. I know. Yeah. Well, here's a, here's a little secret. I want to get that. Chuck Dixon and Graham back on too. Yeah. I want to talk to them about some. Well, stuff. Niall has scheduled. We Niall is scheduling into April, and Niall has open slots for all the that he has reserved for <laughs> all these people that he wants on that we have to contact. And that's why we're going to be doing our double up shows and stuff. Plus also with deadlines and all we, maybe we should oh, yeah. do just two shows a week or two or three. That's it. But, but uh, that's another thing. It's like, Oh, we're all booked. But the little secret is there are some dates that aren't quite booked, but Niall has, has put a lock and key on them and no one can get to them because that's reserved for Larry Hammer and that's reserved for Chuck and stuff like that. So, oh, yeah. Well, before we go, I just want to. I wanted to. Or maybe <laughs> Shooter, huh? Maybe Shooter. I don't know. I, I, does anyone I know him? Man. Yeah. Does anyone know Jim Shooter? Does anyone yeah. know Jim Shooter? Just, just a little. <laughs> Jeff doesn't uh, want to go that way. Jeff doesn't want us to have Jim Shooter on. I think it would be great. I think it'd be fantastic. And I, I can tell you. I think we're blowing Blevins' mind right now. You know what's what's really great? What's yeah? I can see that. I was just going to give a shout out to Brian uh, and to uh, uh, TJ. Uh, but I just wanted to say, like, you know, I've been talking to, I've been talking to, I, I've been talking to Shooter and, you know, this is the thing, this is the thing that happens when you talk to these guys that have lived this history. Mm -hmm. I started talking about how I was so excited because I had worked, I had worked for 10 years. You got to get a mute button. I know um, I have a mute button on my Mac. I don't have it on. Oh, Bye yeah. Billy. There you go. Um, so. <laughs> I'm listening. I can hear you. So we, I'm talking to him about how excited I was to get the Jerry Siegel Superman cover yeah. that was unpublished that I used on Overstreet 45. Mm -hmm. And I had worked for 10 years to get that. And I was so excited about it. And I'm telling, I'm telling Shooter this over lunch. And he goes, yeah, Jerry. I said, I meant Joe Schuster. I said, Jerry Siegel. And he goes, yeah, Jerry Siegel used to hang out in my office. And I'm like, you can shut up now. Isn't that, that's incredible. That's absolutely incredible. Yeah, who gets but that to, is, but you're who right. Gets, I mean, who gets to say that? Yeah, exactly. And like what you guys were saying, I mean, you know, the comic uh, community from, from my experience now, you know, getting my name out there, doing things, going to conventions, having those dinners, right? Yeah. It's just, it's very, you almost get intimidated at first because it's like, oh, you know, but then it's just like really just talking to to another uh, guy or girl that likes comics like this and that. I, I remember and, literally, and you're literally first time I met Walt Simonson and, 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 and Wheezy and, and Walt, I was 18 years old. I was working at Lone Star and Walt treated me like a person, you know, and talked mm -hmm. intelligently to me, mm -hmm. like not like I was an idiot. Mm -hmm. uh, which yeah. I was. Uh, and 
it was can, just yeah. We can it, hear you, Billy. I'm gonna say it, it, it was. It just the, there's so much there's so much great stuff about mm. this that you one of the reasons that I look. Give me an opportunity. I'm just going to keep talking. Literally, one person, one person ever, has ever figured out how to get me to shut up, and that was Mr. Tucci here by putting a Medal of Honor winner opposite me at dinner. Yes, yes. <laughs> that's, that's also the only time. What did I say? What did I say that whole night? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. No, yeah, sir. <laughs> that was one of the ages. Well, you know, and 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 the surrealism of it all is is uh, like I said, we're in Albuquerque, and I had dinner with Larry Hama Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night. That's and we would just go up and say, Larry, you have dinner plans? He's like, no, I was going to get a burger in the hotel restaurant. I'm like, no, come out with us. And, and, and the same thing then was like, well, what about Marv? You know, Marv's wife was with him, Noel, and, and he, was always, he was really busy. Obviously, it was a week, the show, the week yeah. after the show came yeah. out. And uh, so we didn't know. But then I'm like, you know, what the heck with this? So my friend James Sanchez, I'm like, I'm going to ask him. So I'm like, Marv, do you guys have dinner plans? He's like, no. I'm like, would you like to go to Buku de Beppo? <laughs> with us, he's like, I yes, I love that place. And you know, three hours later, I I I, I hear Billy, Billy, and I turn to my left, and there's Marv with a plate of meatball saying, Would you like a meatball? And there's <laughs> our wolf man is passing meatballs to me. <laughs> I'm like, someone take a picture of this. Well, yes, Marv, I would like some meatballs. I am working, I'm working with a uh uh a programmer, a developer. Uh, and we were at Steve Jeppy's 70th birthday a couple of Friday nights ago. And, and this is me name dropping Billy. Yes. And so I'm standing there talking to shooter and he didn't, and it was loud enough that the guy didn't hear me introduce him. <laughs> and so he asked Jim, what did he do? What does he do in the industry? Oh, Okay, Jim was sitting down, so he wasn't standing up, so you didn't know. Okay, it's Jim Shooter, right? Right, right yeah. <laughs> so, my, my my friend Sean asks, "What do you do in the industry?" And I just looked at him like, you know, you obviously you didn't hear what I said. <laughs> what he does in the industry is he's Jim Shooter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see his eyes go real wide, right? And so, a couple minutes later, it's it's him and me and Paul Levins. So we're standing there with the two greatest Legion of Superhero writers ever. And and this is this is what I got to say. Who gets to do that? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I know business-wise, I can I can call Paul up and we'll go and we'll go we'll go to lunch and he's been very gracious with his time and it's very informative. Yeah. And, and he comes, Jim he comes up to people at at every every convention he's there, he'll stop by people's booths to say hello and tables. And he and really out of his way, Paul Levitz. What a, a prince. And 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 the great thing about the great thing about Paul is Paul started in fanzines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if you think about it, he starts his career interviewing Will Eisner and ends up publishing Will Eisner. Yeah. I mean, and and there's so many great things that I could you can say about him. His stewardship of DC comics is just amazing. And then, and then Shooter, man, I've been on a conference call with him where we, where we were sort of consulting with some people that were thinking about doing a contest about something. And so Jim listens really patiently and says, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. And then, <laughs> and then honest to goodness, spends 20 minutes telling them how to make it work totally. Uh <laughs> and, 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 and that's what these guys, that's what these guys do. You guys heard what Marvel was talking about, about the sweat he put into and the time he took to get Crisis right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And some of these guys, when they when they are at their best, do stuff that makes the best from the rest of us look pathetic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's 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 so and I you could take that as demoralizing. I take it as encouraging because to me, it's it's work. Get better, learn from the best. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. I agree a hundred percent. Right. Well, on that, I think that's a great way to to sit to bid adieu. Really? I got to go to bed. I, I was just going to say. I think we we need to Billy. We need to have an Overstreet Comic Price Guide episode. 
Well, when does the price guide come out? The new one? Oh, well, we've got a bunch this year. Let me tell you. All right. Well, it's, it's you know, I'll tell you, I, we should, we, <laughs> we should do a show about that. And I will be very glad to do that. I'll get maybe some of my, some of my uh, coworkers on. Yeah. That'd be uh, fantastic. I, I think one of the, the great things about this is uh, we just started uploading for the printer today. Uh, the facsimile edition of Overstreet number one. Oh, really? And that comes out April first, and with the with Action Comics number one in mint for three hundred dollars, um, yeah. Detective Comics number twenty seven in mint for two hundred and seventy five dollars. Wow! Yeah, this is our fiftieth anniversary. You want to do that on? No, the it's your fiftieth anniversary. We have to do a show then. And well, the, yeah, because we'll, we'll have to do it. Can we the the fir, April first? Can we do it on April second, Old Bean? Well, I don't know why not. Okay, great. Because and April, then, yeah, we've got a, we've got another book uh, coming out in May, which we will announce very shortly. Uh, that has a cover by Mister Jesco, um, and then uh, Over Street Fifty comes out July twenty second, the Wednesday of San Diego. Yes, as always, and. We're really, really excited about this year. Uh, we'll probably also uh, do a new edition of the grading guide in the fourth quarter. Uh, oh, and I got and I got and I got to tell you that the response we've been getting to Overstreet One uh, is really stunning. I mean, we we've we're really happy. Um, uh, we 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 wanted a cool we wanted a cool thing to celebrate our 50th anniversary. And so we said, why don't we do a facsimile edition? People seem to like them now. And uh, as we've seen with, you know, new versions of she number one and uh, all that kind of stuff. And some of the great ones that Marvel and DC have put out. And uh, it's not strictly speaking a, a facsimile edition because it had a modern ad in it, but uh, uh, IDW just put out St uh, Marv's Star Trek, the motion picture adaptation. That was a Marvel super special way back when. Wow. And, I have and they, that graded, and they put it out magazine size. Yeah. So it was really, it's really cool. Um, so we couldn't do it stapled. You know, there's no, there's no spine on the original Over Street Number One. So it is, it, we we sort of dodged that. Uh, but otherwise, it's a very faithful facsimile. We had to put in new new legalese, and uh, one of the coolest things was Bob Overstreet was able to find. A font online that matched his 1970 typewriter. No oh, way! Wow. <laughs> That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and and so he got into it too, which was really, which was really great. Fantastic! All right, gentlemen. All right, lots of great shows this year. Lots of great books yes. coming out. Lots of great shows. Lots of convention appearances. Yes, Scala, indeed. what are you doing for Comic Book Day? I'm hanging out with Billy Tucci. Uh, old Bean, are you going to hang out with me? I may uh, do that. I haven't figured it out yet. You're certainly going to have the Overstreet cover there because I'll make yeah. sure you do. Uh, and Where are you going to be? Which I'm, shop? I, I know I'm going to. I know I'm going to be at Comic Book Depot. There's a real good chance that I will be at uh, Best Comics. They have always mm -hmm. invited me, uh, and it's my reg in my regular stores. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah, and uh, I might do. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna. And, and, you know what? and truthfully, I don't. As much as I want to hang out with you, Billy, I I love the idea that my books in multiple locations. Yeah. Uh, I don't know where the I don't know if the frames are sending any place this year, but if we can get us all in a bunch of different places, and so you know, PR wise, I can announce gemstones represented in all these places. Hey, I love hey, that. Hey, old bean, is that book printed already or no? No, 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 no. Can we? Uh, can you? Is it possible that maybe you can add like a two by three inch box? a blank box and say sketch here and and all the people signing the book artists could do a little sketch in there a little remark sketch and it's no. not like no. <laughs> no there is a there is, there, is, there, is a place, there is a place on the back cover that has a white box where uh the stores usually can put a stamp but since i'm sending you copies of it too you can put a sketch there on the but back? it's the back cover it's not the front cover all right well we'll see yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm an editor exploiting the masses. Deal with it. There you go. All right. Well, thank you, guys. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you to yeah. our moderators. Uh, did Mandy leave? She might have left. She was working super hard. And uh, Blevins, of course, is here. TJ, our friend. Uh, man, all you guys that were on the show, thank you so much. What a wonderful show. Great job, That's Niall. Fantastic. Great job. And we'll see you all I, next week. I think, you know, I just got to say real quickly. It appears that if we tossed a knife between Blevins and TJ, there might be a problem. <laughs>
just reading <laughs> just reading the chats here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Have a good night. All right, everyone. Have a great night. I'll Bye, talk guys. to you tomorrow, guys. Tell you. I'm still here. Who wants to talk to me? Do 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 do. All right, everyone. Have a great night. Hey guys, thanks again for tuning into Crowdfunding Comics. We look forward to hanging out with all of our crowdfunding fans every time we go live. And don't forget to click the link below and subscribe to our channel. And there's a little bell. You may want to hit that too. This way you get all the great notifications when we go live and when we upload some awesome content. You want to follow us? Sure, go right ahead at Twitter at Crowdfund Comics with an X. Instagram, Crowdfunding Comics, and Facebook at Crowdfunding Comics. Till next time, crowdfunding fans, we'll see you soon.